Uh, good, good morning. So good to see you guys this morning, man, to have a time of communion. I really praise the Lord for men like Tim that uh, just seeing him, uh, the, the way he's just grown in the Lord and in the time that I've known him and to to be obedient, even though I threaten his life sometimes, <laughs> but to be obedient to go, to go through with, I know they're bigger than me. All I could do is threaten their life. I can't really do anything to them, but they don't know that. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 14 as we continue in this chapter where the Apostle Paul continues to make the point of order especially the order when it comes to the spiritual gifts that we have been covering for the last several weeks as we've been in these chapters from chapter 12 to the end of this chapter. And he's talking about the order of how it should look like when the churches come together and what it means to be together. And last week we got through half of the chapter. And and so this morning we will pick it up in verse 20 and and read the rest of the text and, and cover the rest of the chapter. Um, I, I just got to let you know that that in, in the process of our going through, and, and I always refer to the Amplified Bible. It's one of my favorite go-to just to get a, a, a more amplified look uh, of, of what the Greek really has been saying because it, the Amplified kind of takes from all the from the Strong's and the Thayer's Concordance, and it just kind of throws it in there. And so I I will be sharing (laughs) several verses from there, um, partly to give us better clarity, if you will, given the fact that uh, this portion of Scripture has a a couple, a few difficult texts in it. And so um, we will move through them, um, and so bear with me when I go through them. Uh, I'll try to give the old high school try. (laughs) So verse 20 to the end of the chapter. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet for all that they will not hear, says the Lord. Therefore, Tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who are believers, or who believe. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed and unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced of all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, each of you, has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has an in, a revelation, has an interpretation, let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let it be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church. And let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak. And let the others judge. But if if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For For you can all prophesy one by one, and all may learn, and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silent in the churches. 
for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn anything, let them ask their husband, their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. And if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brothers, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid the speaking of tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. A lot to cover, but we will cover it. He starts this portion of the text as he's kind of almost wrapping up this whole section that we've been covering for the last few months with the word brethren. And I've shared with you throughout this letter that our time in 1 Corinthians in the book that it is a very corrective letter. I don't know if you guys have sensed that. That, that, that through this letter, there has been some harshness in how he comes across, but there's also been sarcasm. But I love the fact that throughout the book, Paul has not ceased from calling them brethren. In, in other words, this enduring term, he continues to acknowledge them as, as his Christian brothers and sisters within the Christian community that, 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 that there is something about being brethren, even though you have to talk harsh and sometimes, sometimes you're being sarcastic and being corrective, that at the end of the day, you are still brothers and sisters. And, and this word brethren, it does encompass both male and female. I was going to make a joke about that in this day and age, or whatever you are. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> male and female, that's it. That's all there is, right? And, and I have made that point time and time again about him calling them brethren because I believe that it's important for us to understand that. That, that when you study and read 1 Corinthians and, and the harshness and the, and the tone of it, that's important to understand that even in their worst, when, when, when they were at their worst, Paul never wrote them off. He always called them brethren. When, when, when he's dealing with their carnality, when he's dealing with, with their, their, their immorality even, when he's dealing with the disorderly conduct of how they were conducting themselves, knowing that, that they lacked love for one another, he still called them brethren. And I think oftentimes we write people off when we don't agree with them. But they're, brother, they're your brother and sister. And again, I think we write off our, our biological family because it's like, ah, they're going to be your family regardless. But not all of them are going to be in heaven. Guess who's going to be in heaven? Your brothers and sisters that you might disagree with, that you might have a bone of contention with. You're going to see them for all eternity. And, and, and so again, there's this thing about being called brethren, being part of the family of God. And, and that's why I kept on, I, and I have kept, just reminding us about this word brethren. Because it's important for us to understand that. He says, brethren, do not be children in your understa in understanding, however in malice be babes. By nature, children are immature, mainly because of their age. I, and, I, I, and even teenagers, they're immature. They might think they know a lot, but they're immature. They are, they are not mature in their understanding. There, there are certain things that they're learning along the way, and they're growing in their maturity... And even as, as adults, what, what is it? Our, our brain isn't fully developed until like 28. I think they moved it to 30-something. Let's move it to about 40-something, you know? But, but, but again, it's like we're maturing. 
And, and so he says, I don't want you to be children when it comes to your understanding, to your maturing. And, and so he, he uses that word children to indicate, to point to immaturity. The, the, the Amplified puts it like this, brethren, do not be children immature in your thinking. Continue to be babes in matters of evil. But in your mind, be mature men. And, and I like the way he says that, that again, he wants you to be mature in your understanding, but when it comes to the evil things, be, be naive about it if you can. Put, you know, it's like be babes when it comes to that. And, 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 and so often we're, we're very hard in our, in our maturity when it comes to evilness and, 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 and malice and things like that. It's like, no, 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 let's turn that around. In your understanding of what we should be doing and treating each other and loving one another, he says, I want you to be mature in that. The, the, these Corinthians, they were infatuated with the gift of tongues. And it was manifested in their immaturity in how they conducted themselves. Even in their worldliness, their carnality and their, in, in, in their lack of love, the way they, they, they did things, thinking that they were spiritual when they really were not. And, and, and tongues kind of proved that in that, in that, in that vein. This whole gift of tongues that they were infatuated with, it kind of spotlighted their, their selfish desire to edify themselves at the expense of others. And I think oftentimes when God has gifted us with certain things, we end up using it in such a way that makes other people feel less than because they're not as spiritual as you. And, and that, that, that was them to the T. That the gift of tongues was being used and it was being brought forth, but there was no love. And it was showing themselves actually, as Paul declares here, them to be children in that way, that they were selfishly immature. And I think that his hope here, he, he's pointing to a higher call to understand that, you know, you think that you're spiritual, but in, in, in all rights, you're, you're acting very immature by the way you possess or, or present yourself as being so godly and, and mature. You're not. And I think his heart in sharing what he has been sharing throughout this time was that he hoped that there would be a change in their life, that they would mature somewhat, especially in, the, in regards to the greater importance of what the gift of prophecy was all about. And that they might recognize that that gift of prophecy what was more important by far when we assembled together, however they assembled together, that by far prophecy was a better gift. And so these final words of exhortation that we look at in this text, in this portion, especially from verse 21 to verse 25, he's contrasting these two gifts, prophecy and tongues. And he was intending to exhort them the way he began this chapter by saying, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts but especially that you may prophesy. And so, so that's the crux of, of what this chapter, chapter 14, is all about. Let me give you the order, but let me tell you what this thing looks like. And what he does is in verse 21, he says, in the law it is written. Now, it's interesting because this is not so much the first five books of the Bible, but it's the prophet Isaiah that he will be, he will be quoting here. But but he says, and the law is you know in the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips uh, will speak to this people, and yet for all of that they will not hear. And he's quoting Isaiah twenty-eight verses eleven and twelve. 
and, 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 and it means, or let me read the, the text to you, because again, sometimes when Paul kind of refers back there, he kind of cuts out certain things, but he wants to get to the point. He says in, in Isaiah 28, 11, and 12, he says, For with stammering lips and other tongues he will speak to his people, to this people, to whom he says, This is the rest in which you may cause cause the weary to rest and and this is refreshing yet they will not hear and so he quotes from isaiah but he kind of cuts out certain things to get to the crux of what he's trying to to share with them and what we need to know about isaiah 28 is that the the apostle isaiah or the apostle the prophet isaiah is announcing judgment on the children of israel that's what that chapter is talking about. But they did not receive the words that came from the prophet who spoke to them in their language, in Hebrew. And so now they will hear the voices of other men whom they can't understand. Men's of, men of other tongues and other lips, if you will. And he is speaking about the Assyrians because when he's talking about uh, this he's talking about the northern kingdom who would who would be coming that the Assyrians would be coming and taking them first before the southern kingdom but he's saying these people they will come and speak their own language these these, these Assyrian in, invaders will, will, will speak in a language that the Israelites will not be able to understand and it is an example of the judgment that would be coming upon the Israelites, and yet, for all of that, he says, they will not hear me, says the Lord. And so for, for whatever reason, and I don't quite comprehend this part, <laughs> for whatever reason, the Apostle Paul uses that quote from Isaiah in regards to the children of Israel to convey to the Corinthian church that just like the children of Israel... They didn't understand what was being said by the Assyrians. And when they get into their groups and they all speak in tongues, it's almost like the Assyrians coming in and going, they're going, we don't understand what you're saying. That other people would be in these gatherings and, and, and it would not be productive in any way, shape, or form. Because nobody understood when everybody was speaking in tongues. And so nobody was being edified in that gathering. In, in the case of the children of Israel, what was being spoken of to them was a sign of judgment, and yet they didn't understand that judgment was coming because they didn't speak the language. And so what they were speaking to them was judgment, not a sign of blessing. Not that judgment was, was being spoken of on the Corinthians here, but it wasn't a blessing either. <laughs> Nobody was blessed when people were talking in different languages. And so he, he shares that, and he goes right into verse 22, and this is probably one of the, as, as I'm listening to other people and reading other things, probably one of the hardest verses to interpret, they were saying. And I'm thinking, well, shoot, if you guys can't figure it out, how am I going to figure that one out? So let me just read it to you through the Amplified. Maybe it makes a little bit more sense. Maybe not. Verse 22 in the Amplified. Thus unknown tongues are meant for a supernatural sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers on the point of believing. While prophecy inspired preaching and teaching, uh, interpreting the divine will and purpose is not for unbelievers on the point of believing, but for believers. And I will leave you with that. <laughs> Because it, 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 it's, it's difficult. And, and so he goes on to verse 23. He says, therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there comes in those who are uninformed, 
or unbelievers, yet uh, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy, and, be, and, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced of all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Now, even though verse 22 <laughs> is hard to understand, Verses 23 to 25 are not very hard to understand. If anything, I think it makes very good sense in how he conveys what he's trying to get across to them, especially when it comes to the issue of order, which has been the context of what he's trying to say from chapter 12 to, to chapter 14. And so one of the things that works for me is that when I come across a portion of Scripture that is really hard to understand, just in a straight reading like verse 22 is, I go back and I read it several times. Okay, am I missing? Because I have dyslexia. And I transpose words all the time. And so I have to read this thing 15 times in order to, to, to read it in front of you. <laughs> Before I ever read it. Yesterday I was doing a, a memorial service. And somebody said, I can't do it. Here, read this. I was like, ah! I haven't practiced it. And so now it's like, ah! So, and yeah, you're probably thinking, you mean you practice reading? It's like, yeah, I know it doesn't sound like it all the time. But, but bless your hearts. And, and so... So when I read it several times and it's still not making sense, I will go to the amplifier, I will go to the NLT, I will go to the NIV, I will go through every, every translation to see, is somebody else making it clearer for me? And still when there is no clarity, <laughs> and I have exhausted everything possible, reading commentaries and, and all of those things, and when other people who are way smarter than me can't even figure it out and come to a satisfying consensus, then I move on, just like I did earlier. <laughs> because at least, at least 23, 24, and 25 make way more sense to me than verse 20, 22 did. And so I don't mean to skip out on you, <laughs> but I don't want to say something and, and go, let me give you the 20 different versions that I read, and let me give you the t five different commentaries I've read. <laughs> and they're all going like, man, it doesn't make sense. So, Paul has been addressing the issue of order. And not just the, the order in our individual lives, but also when it came to them coming together. And, and, and what he does in verses 23 to 25 is that he he ends up posing some situations of those who are unbelievers coming into an assembly and assessing the situation. And so we have a what if situation. What if the whole church is speaking in tongues at the same time? and the uninformed or an unbeliever walks in, what would be their assessment? <laughs> their assessment would be, you are out of your mind. In other words, their conclusion would be that you are mad. To rave as a maniac. To be beside yourselves. The Amplified puts it, that you are demented. Ooh. But that's their assessment, walking in going, what the heck is going on? Now what I found interesting is that the word for uninformed in the Greek is idiotes. <laughs> idiotes. In Spanish is idiota. A personal Pers or a private person, i.e. by implication, an ignoramus idiot is what the strong says. 
And that is the person that is making the judgment coming into a church that is all speaking in tongues. All at the same time. But he said, but if they prophesy, what if? What if, in that situation, what if the whole church is prophesying? And that same person, that same type of person walked in, what would his assessment be? Well, because he understands what is being said, even though he may be an unbeliever or uninformed, an idiot, if you will, as the word says. Hence the word. Chances are that that person, with the understanding that he is a sinner in need of a Savior, will be able to fall down and say, God, please forgive me for what he has been hearing. It says thus all his secrets basically will, will be revealed. However, however that is. And I love this. I love the fact that that people might be prophesying, things might be going on, the preaching might be going on, there's prophecy going through it, that God is able to speak to whoever, from the intellect to the idiot. And I don't know if there's a much difference. <laughs> I don't know. Be because what can be done through the gift of prophecy, whether people are giving words or the preacher is preaching... That, that all of a sudden, what's hidden in their hearts is being revealed in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. Using people. And, and this is what I love because there's some people that's like, well, you didn't give an altar call today. And it's like, yeah, I didn't. But you know who is still working? Yeah. The Holy Spirit. Yeah. Whether I gave an altar call or not. And, and, and so I'm not opposed to that because when the Lord leads me to do it, I will, lead, I will do it. But even if I don't do it, if the word of God is going out, if any kind of prophecy is coming out, then the Holy Spirit knows how to be the Holy Spirit and is still able to convict someone, to convince someone and convict someone so that they fall down and worship God with or without my help. With or, my, with or without my, my understanding in that respect. And so I, I love the fact that, again, through this gift of prophecy, there is this unique way that the Holy Spirit can work in people's lives more so than, than speaking in tongues will ever. And for some reason, they can take hold of something that, that was said, and in that they bow down and worship. And so in verse 26, he says, How then, how is it then, brethren? He, 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 he throws out this conclusion to his brethren, and he's basically saying, What then is the right course that we should be taking? Knowing that, that, that a, a room full of people speaking in language, people would think that you're a madman or demented, and yet, if there's prophecy going on and somebody is being convicted by the Holy Spirit, what's our course of action? What should we be doing? Is what he's saying here. Now, understand that back then, even having a meeting like this was kind of rare. Not that they didn't have meetings like this. But back then, they didn't have the larger churches. And believe it or not, people was like, oh, we have a small little church. By all rights, in, in most of the country, this is a big church, especially that we have two services. They're like, well, all the seats aren't filled. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but again, if we had one service, they wouldn't fit here. Yeah. And, and, and so, again, most churches are not even as big as ours. And, and, and what, 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 what was going on back then, they didn't, they didn't gather to get together like this on a regular basis, but that's not to say that they didn't at times. Periodically, they did. But more often than not, they met in people's houses. They had house churches. And it was in those settings that many of these gifts were being utilized. 
because it was a small, smaller gathering. And it would be in those kinds of, of settings that others besides the leaders would be able to share their gifts. It, it would be in those smaller settings that someone might give a reading or, or sing a psalm. Others might, might have a word of teaching. Someone might, might pray in tongues and, and someone else might, might be interpreting. Still others might have a word of revelation from the Lord, from His heart, in this gathering. A, a small fellowship of that type, of that setting, is, is how most of the churches back then worked. And so it, it was common for them to be doing stuff, but when they gathered together, and somebody came in and everybody's doing it, it just wouldn't have worked right. I think it would, it would be harder in a much larger setting to have everybody give their little portion that they came with. We'd be here forever. Now, some people are like, that'd be great. Other people are like, no, man, you go more than 45 <laughs> minutes. I'm already going, I hate you, Zeke. You're getting into my breakfast time. So we're very cautious about time, believe it or not. We're very cautious about time, but we have other times like home studies or Thursday nights or, or special studies that we might be able to encourage one another with the gifts that God has gifted you with. But even in those smaller settings, there's oftentimes pitfalls that, 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 that come with that smaller setting because it, it is in those smaller settings where, where people that have poor doctrine or weaker character can, can truly dominate a small group if there's no real leader overseeing a group like that. And what would be lacking is maybe the truth of the word, but more of how you feel. What do you feel about what the word says? I found this little story in one of the commentaries, and I loved it. Spurgeon once described a man coming from such a meeting, a, a gathering, meeting a friend. How was the meeting? The one asked. The other answered, oh, it was wonderful. No one knew anything, but we taught each other. <laughs> but we all taught each other. <laughs> and, and, and so again, even in our home studies or, or special groups, the, the, we want an overseer there that if somebody goes, well, I think it says this, it's like, okay, now let me bring it back and tell you what the Word of God says. Because again, we all have different feelings. And in, in, in some, some areas, it's like, no, let's just talk about our feelings. It's like, great. But the truth of the Word of God is what needs to be shared. And, and, and so I, I, I think it would be safe to say that a house church or a la large gathering, there really isn't no right or wrong to it, which, because people are like, well, people, churches shouldn't be big. They should all be small. It's like, I get that. But, but having a get-together like this is not bad also because God has used both, and he is using both. And he will continue to use both because I believe both of them are essential. I think gathering together is needful for health and strength of the whole body in situations like this. And I think in, in the smaller group, we oftentimes have the heart of everyone shares something with everyone else. But I think that that can happen in a larger gathering as well. To be able to, be, to, to express and share and manifest that whole idea of everyone shares something with everyone else, I, I, I think we should have this mindset it, when we are coming to church. I'm coming to church not only to receive a blessing, but I'm coming to church to also give a blessing to someone else. And I think our hearts should always be when we walk into these doors, it's like, Lord, feed me, take care of me. It doesn't matter what Zeke says. I want to know what the Word of God says. But Lord, how can I minister to someone else as well? How can I be a blessing 
for someone else. And so we're praying for opportunities. Lord, put someone in my, in my path that I can minister to and bless them as I get blessed. I think, I think what's important in gatherings, especially on a Sunday morning, Thursday night's a little smaller as there's a lot more fellowship. We change things up quite a bit on Thursday nights. But I think in a gathering like this on a Sunday morning, I think this is why it's so important to get here a little earlier. That's me. My wife, different story. <laughs> I think that's why the first 15 minutes before church are very important, and the last 30 minutes of church or after church are very vital because that's when I see a lot of the body ministry going on. What, what, what we should be doing is looking out for an opportunity to encourage people, to pray with people, to help people, to meet people, and then to love on people. I think it's a, it's a mistake if somebody said, well, if I'm not preaching up there, I can't really be a blessing to anyone. It's like, no, you can, you can always be a blessing. Let all things be done, he says at the end of verse 23, for edification, all of it, everything we do. And I think our, our goal in coming together should not be to be entertained or, 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 or to just receive a blessing. We, we should be gathering together for edification of the body, to build one another up, spiritually speaking, to be there for one another that in all that we say and do, we can glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, not only in this building, but outside this building. As people get together outside this, this building or they minister to the people outside these walls. Our gathering together here should be like what Ephesians 4.12 tells us. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. In other words, I get the privilege of standing here and going, this is what God's word tells you to go do, let's go do it. Again, now it would be bad if I never went and did it and just expected you to do it. But my heart is, Lord, when I'm outside these walls, I want to, you know, I'm not Pastor Zeke every day. Well, I am, but I'm not. I'm a Christian, first and foremost. I don't find my identity in being a, a pastor. I am a Christian wherever I'm at. And so our heart should be being edified so we can go out and be a blessing wherever we, we find ourselves. That should be our goal because ministry Real ministry, I would say it, I'm going to put that in quotes, is done outside the church in the lives of other people. Here we just, we're able to upreach and inreach, but our hearts should always be for outreach, to live and, and, and to be strengthened, to be built up so that we can be equipped to go do what God has called us to. And so moving on, he says in verses 25 to about 33, he kind of gives us a, a synopsis of what he's been trying to get at. He says, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let it be two or three at the most, each in turn, and let the others interpret. For if there is no interpreter, then <clears throat> let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself. And to God. Again, Paul has been talking about the issue of order, Christian order, which would translate into church order. And he gives us some specific instructions of how it should look like and how it should be functioning. And I would say that is very straightforward. It's very direct and even simple that there's really not much to interpret. But I can't help myself. To interpret what he's saying <laughs> even though it's so it, it, it's so plain again he's saying if a tongue has to be uttered corporately in the corporate setting in any corporate setting it is to be done or not done simultaneously yeah it shouldn't be done all at the same time it should be done in order one by one and it's not to go on and on and on and on he says it should be one or uh, two or at the most three. That, that, that that's the way it should be done. And in this, Paul is bringing order to that setting of gathering together. So nobody walks in and freaks out going, what the heck is going on? 
So nobody is freaking out. And then he says, if somebody does that and there is no interpreter, he says that then that focus, again, if there is an interpreter, the focus will be directed to God, but if there's no interpreter, he says, then it's time for you to be quiet. Do it at home. Now, he's not forbidding speaking in tongues. He's just saying, that was not the place to do it at home between you and God. And again, he says, let, let, let it be only this many. And then he continues on in verse 20, 29. He says, and let, uh, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. And again, once again, he's giving us direction of how we should desire this gift. And in the same kind of setting, corporately, those who hear it, and it's being done in order, those who hear it, especially I would say the leaders, but not exclusively, should judge what has been said to see if it's from the Lord. I do think that sometimes when we hear, thus says the Lord in a corporate setting, or when somebody approaches you and says, I have a word from the Lord for you specifically, that it is always to be judged and tested. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Paul also shared in Galatians 1, 8, he says, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which was preached, let him be accursed. And, and so everything should line up with the word of God. If somebody speaks it out, corporately or if somebody comes to you is like here the lord told me to share this with you then it should line up with this because you're testing it against this not against your not because of how you feel or how they feel but against the word of god and he says if, it, if anything is revealed to someone else who is sitting there he says if somebody else uses that then then if you thought, oh, I'm going to share a prophecy and somebody else shares it, then he says, then respectfully refrain and or restrain and, hum, and in humility let somebody else go before you. Again, so that there's no confusion going on. In verse 31, he says, for you all can prophesy one by one and all may learn and all may be encouraged. And I think the optimal word there is all. That we can all be a part of this. And wouldn't it be sad if, 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 if the brethren came together and it's only about one person. And they're the only ones that are being blessed. And you walk away going, well, they got all the attention. They hogged up everything. They, they sucked the air out of the room. That would be a shame. No. And he gives some more instruction. He says, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, it can be controlled. All of it can be controlled. It's very important for us to understand that this verse, what it's telling us, that the Holy Spirit doesn't take control and now you can't help yourself and you're flopping around. It's like, oh, no, that's demon possession. That happens that way. Or somebody's like, ah, you know, the Spirit was just moving. And it's like the, the, the Holy Spirit is also in control. <laughs> Warren Wiersbe said that he was at a conference and this guy just kept on going and going and going. And they all had time slots. And he goes, well, it was just the Spirit moving. And he says, well, the spirits are subject to the prophets as well. Like you could have cut it <laughs> to let everybody else speak. And so again, everything should be done decently and in order. Even when the Spirit is moving in a powerful way, He is always in control. Always. God never loses control. He never brings confusion in an assembly like this, or He shouldn't, or He would never, and we shouldn't confuse the matter. It's, it, it was happening back then as far as Paul saying, this is the way it ought to be, and it should still be today. <clears throat> Verse 34 and 35, he says, <clears throat> Let your women keep silent in the church, 
for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their, hu- their own husband at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, I don't have anything else to, s- to add to that. I thought it was very straightforward, (laughs) very direct, and very simple. So let's move on. (laughs) Again, we've already covered in in chapter 11. Chapter 11, (laughs) you guys. Chapter 11, Paul already assumed that women had the right to pray and to prophesy in public. In, in gatherings, back in chapter 11, go back and read it or listen to it again. And, and, and perhaps he is talking here because of the context, he is talking about the whole judging part of the, the gifts. Perhaps that's what he's talking about. I'm not quite sure, but perhaps he's talking about women that would usurp the, the authority of the leadership in these issues. Maybe that's why he's saying, hey, calm down, woman. Well, maybe. I'm just saying maybe. That's what Paul would say, not me. Jeez. Brian, shut your wife up. No. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Is it getting hot in here or is it just me? But be that as it may, he says, if they want to learn, if if there's more, and and we have to understand again the the, the times, that in the ancient times, again, and and even in some modern cultures, women and men, they sit on different sides. You know, they, 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 they segregate each other for some reason. And it's quite possible that the Corinthian church had done the same thing. And there was a problem when they gathered together and there was disruptions because they're going, hey, Harry, I don't know what this guy is saying. And he's going, keep them quiet. Learn at home. Ask your husband. Take a note. It's like, hey, what was that preacher boy saying there? I didn't quite get it. Now, the problem would be is like, well, my husband knows nothing, which is a shame. But be that as it may, again, things were being disrupted in the Corinthian church. And Paul is saying, don't disrupt the meeting. Ask your question at home. And so in most Jewish synagogues, the women and the men, they sat in different places. And again, it it could be that they adapted that that frame or, or the way they conducted themselves in that way. The Corinthian church did. It's quite possible, but, but also you got to remember, there was some, some women that came from the Greek background or, or the Gentile background that they didn't know the protocol, if you will, or maybe some of the Jewish women with their freedom thinking, heck, I could talk, I couldn't do it before, but now I can do it. And so again, he's kind of addressing that with them here. And so in verse 36 to 38, let me read it to you through the Amplified says, what? Did the word of the Lord originate with you, Corinthians? Or has it reached only you? If anyone thinks or claims that he is a prophet, filled with and governed by the Holy Spirit of God and inspired to interpret the divine will and purpose in preaching or teaching, or has any special endowment, let him understand, recognize, and acknowledge that what I am writing to you is a command of the Lord. But if anyone disregards or does not recognize that it is a command of the Lord, he is is disregarded and not recognized. He is one whom God knows not. And, And so what he's basically saying there is, again, understand that what I'm writing to you I feel like the Lord is leading me to tell you this, but if you think that you're way more spiritual than any of this, then you go on with your bad self. Again, I I will back off. And so Paul is not trying to push his authority, but he is being kind of sarcastic here. Thinking, oh, did the word of the Lord only come to you, Corinthians? 
So he says, that as we finish off here, therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. When you, when you come together as a church, it's far better to be blessed and to be a blessing to someone else. And, and, and therefore, that's why prophecy has been, has been such a useful tool. And that's why Paul is saying, no, desire this. Don't forbid the speaking in tongues. They have their place. And again, if, if, if Paul was, if you were to ask him, you know, what's more important in our devotional life, he'd go, man, speak in tongues all, all the time. It's such a refreshing time between you and the Lord. But when we come together, as we're together as a church, his heart was, man, brethren, desire to prophesy. So that not only are you blessed, but other people are blessed. Because you go back to, to verse 26, it says, let all things be done for edification. When we come together, let's build each other up. It's not a one-man show. It's not the guy that's standing in front. It's like, no, my job is to, to, to teach you so that we can all go do the work of the ministry. I'm not here to entertain you, <laughs> although I love having fun. But my heart is that we would take away that we are to lift one another up. We are to encourage one another. And I think that if we do it properly, then we will all receive a mutual blessing. And what happens before service, what happens after service, what happens during service can all be for the edification of the church. I love the, 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 the last part here, that God is a God of order. And he is a God of peace. And he wants order when the church comes together and when the gifts of the Spirit are given in an unscriptural, with unscriptural focus, I think it discredits the true work of the Holy Spirit. I really do. It takes the, 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 the focus off the Holy Spirit on the pers- and onto the person itself. And, and we should never desire that. And it leads to people denying the gifts and saying, ah, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And we miss out as a people. And so he says, again, earnestly desire prophecy, but don't forbid speaking in tongues. But let everything be done decently and in order. Guys, I have to tell you, chapters 12 to, to 14 are, are some of my favorite chapters. And I know I say that about a lot of favorites. <laughs> But they truly are because I think in, in so many ways, just in my pea brain understanding here, it has taught me throughout my years because I think it's pretty plain and simple. And if I can understand it, I think anybody can. And I think it has shaped the way I, I, I conduct myself as a Christian before I'm ever a pastor. It has conducted the way I do church and how I serve God. And, 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 and yes, it has helped me in, in the way I conduct myself as a pastor as well. That's why we try to have everything decently and in order, except for the announcements, but be that as it may. <laughs> sometimes they go off the rail sometimes. But even what we do here, at the end of the day, we want to bring it back and say the focus is on who Christ is and what he is doing in our lives. And that if we conduct ourselves the way God wants us to conduct ourselves corporately, then I could almost guarantee you when you're out individually, you will conduct yourself decently and in order because that's what God requires of us, his people. Amen? Amen. Father in heaven, bless you and thank you, Lord God, for this portion of scripture. I pray, God, that I I have been able to do it some justice, even through the hard uh, portions that that we just kind of had to uh, fly over, Lord, Um, that even some of those things you would reveal to us, Lord, the things that we truly do understand. And that we would desire to do that, Lord. Lord, I pray, God, if there's anybody who is here, Lord, who does not know you in any way, or they're so backslidden in such a way, Lord God, that they've just been battling, I pray that even right now, you would draw them. That maybe something they heard, Lord God, has drawn them to understand, Lord God, that you love them because they understood what we were talking about. 
And I pray that I've made it, plain, made it plain and simple, Lord, that they would turn to you and your Holy Spirit has been able to do the work. And so we honor you in that, Lord. And for my brothers and sisters, Lord, Lord, continue to mature them. Continue to take them deeper, Lord, in your word. Continue to give them the gifts that they need, Lord, for their personal lives and for, for corporately, Lord, that you would just use us in powerful ways. And so, Lord, we honor you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.